All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where in the world you're joining us from today. And welcome to the world's most exciting classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. I say this every time we get started. It is an absolutely jam-packed hour that we have in store for you today. There is so much to catch up on, so much new footage, so much has happened since uh, the Ustrascalde has sailed uh, from Ferdinand de Noronha and is making its way towards Salvador on the coast of Brazil. If you are tuning in live via YouTube, use that chat sidebar and say hello. I see someone already saying hello from the Netherlands. Let's find out where everybody's joining us from today. Also, this chat sidebar is the perfect place to send in your questions uh, that you have for anybody joining us today. We'll have an uplink from the ship. We'll talk about coral. We'll talk about the spinner dolphin project. So any questions you have, get those into that side chat bar. So as I mentioned, the ship was just in Fernando de Nerona. Um, while there, the five Darwin leaders had an amazing series of projects that they were working on, conservation projects. In fact, I have a few images queued up here that I'm going to share, and we'll take a look at some of the projects uh, that they were working on. So let's get those nice and opened up for us. And let's get a little look at what this incredible place looked like. So here we go. Here's our first image with the Worcester Scal Day here. Um, looks like maybe sunset or sunrise, Darwin 200 flag streaming. And if we make our way down, we can see some sailing shots here. Absolutely beautiful heading in towards the island. And then we're going to meet Ranva today, Ranva from Fourth Element. And she was on board, so she sailed across the Atlantic with us. And there she is displaying something called the Explorers Club flag. If you have been tuning in before, you know that the Explorers Club is an organization that's been around since 1904. Uh, and explorers from all across the planet are part of this amazing organization. In fact, many of the famous firsts, from the first person on the moon, to the top of Everest, to the deepest point of the ocean, to both poles, uh, were members of the Explorers Club. And these amazing flags uh, are passed out on expeditions and travel around the world. So this flag in particular is flag 101. And it's been traveling around the world on expeditions since 1940. It's been to all the continents. It's been to the top of Everest. Before we got our hands on it, it had just returned from the International Space Station. And I have a cool little video here queued up because we try to fly the flag uh, in a few places as we're making our way around the world. So here's the flag. In photos back up. As I mentioned, we had an amazing series of projects, nurse and lemon shark conservation, octopus conservation, coral reef conservation, the impact of uh, invasive species on seabirds and turtles, as well as spinner dolphin, uh, dolphin uh, conservation. So as we move through a few more of these images, you can see some of the divers there in the water. Uh, here's a picture from the sea turtle crew out on the beach from Project Tamar. There's a cool little, looks like a little ghost crab maybe on the beach there. There's one of our seabirds that looks like a tropic bird. Very cool. And then of course, there was some outreach in the schools, which is always really important to inspire that next generation of scientists, explorers, and conservationists. And there's some more kids there. And then we'll wrap up just with a couple more pictures here. So here we are on the ship on the Oosterskalde. And there we go. It, did come that we did have to leave the island uh, and there we go making our way along the coast towards Salvador and lucky for us we happen to have some people on board the ship right now so you've met Tom and Rodri who were on board doing camera work and so they're taking a little break now and we're lucky to have Josh and Nico joining us let me bring them in live hey Josh hey Nico how are you hello how are you all good here good good it's great to have you with us why don't each of you take a minute and just introduce yourselves? 
So uh, I'm Josh. I'm one of the Darwin 200 camera operators. I come from Bristol in the south of the UK, and I've I've joined all of the ports so far uh, in Tenerife, Cape Verde, and Fernando de Noronha. But this is my first time sailing on the ship, so it's a really interesting, exciting experience. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nicolas. I am the other camera operator from Darwin 200. I am from Argentina. I am 24 years old. I am underwater photographer. It's also my first time sailing, so it's a really exciting moment here living now with Josh and filming and recording all the species, seeing like how the ocean is in the middle of like in the middle of the ocean and living here. All right. Well, we've got a few more groups saying hi, a few groups from the UK, uh, Nova Scotia and Canada, Colombia. So it's great to have a nice international group joining us today. If you have any questions, we'll be on with Josh and Nico for a few more minutes. So if you have any questions about sailing on the ship, now would be a great time uh, to send some of those questions and we'll work one or two in before we, we sign off with them. But uh, Josh and Nico, it sounds like you've been to a few of the locations um, and doing some camera work. So, you know, what's it like going from these different places, going from Tenerife to Cape Verde and then Fernando? What, what's it been like in each of those spots? Um, it's been really interesting because every, although they're all islands, every place has been a completely different experience. So uh, Tenerife is a very uh, European style country, much more to what you're used to when you go on holiday to Spain or to France or something like that. Um, and Cape Verde was a real African, real African nation. And we spent some time on some desert islands there, which was incredible, like nothing I've ever done before. And, um, and Fernando was a, a wonderful, wonderful place, really well taken care of and they're very con uh, conservation minded there um so the the diversity and the um the amount of wildlife there is like nowhere else i've seen anywhere in the world all right and nico were you in some of the previous locations or have you just gotten on no i just got here in fernando de noronha and it's my first time in the oster holder so i was uh, working in some uh, shark conservation projects so I was going around Fernando de Noronha at different locations, seeing the different life stage in sharks with different ages and different uh, species of sharks. And uh, we could find some nurse sharks. We was diving also with uh, lemon sharks. We get the opportunity to see also tiger sharks feeding. So it was a great opportunity wow. to see different behaviors in this uh, like remote island, but really important for the ecosystem, right? Like, like it's Fernando de Noronha. Oh, that's absolutely incredible. So we have a few questions here coming in in the chat. So the first one is, since it's the first time both of you are on the boat, anybody having a little seasickness going on? <laughs> Me, um, two days ago, right? Yeah, two days ago when we started sailing, um, was my first day sailing. And yes, I got actually seasick for uh, the first day, but now I feel like I knew. So it's going Perfect. good now. Perfect. Well, you're in good company because... Uh, Darwin was seasick when he first got on board. And so good company to be in, I think. Yeah. Uh, Woodbury Down Primary School, they're in London. And so they're wondering, um, the waves on the ocean, are they different during the day as opposed to at night? Or do you find that it's it's pretty similar? Um, it seems to be a lot calmer in, in the evenings. And at least when we go to bed at night, it seems to be a lot calmer. But there have been a couple of times we, where at least I've been woken up at sort of three, four o'clock in the morning to things flying around the room. Um, it definitely does take some getting used to. Uh, and you just sort of get get the hang of walking sideways and having to hold on to everything because you never know when a big wave is going to come and, and tip everything off. But on the whole, apparently, according to the uh, according to the crew, this has been a pretty smooth voyage so far. All right. So a few more questions here coming in. Uh, let's start with common species. What's the most common species you've seen so far? So yesterday we get the to see dolphins, but not is usually uh, um, a species to see. But uh, actually we're seeing a lot of birds also, like the boobies, uh, red-footed boobies, brown-footed boobies, masked-footed boobies. Uh, we have also a specialist on board. Uh, he's like uh, watching and making service about birds. So the birds is the most common species we see. But actually we are also in the way of comeback whales. So we don't we didn't see anyone, but maybe we get that in this day and we can see one comeback. That would be, that would be pretty cool. Uh, okay, two more questions and then we'll let you guys go. So the next one is um, from a year five class. How long have you been traveling for? and how deep do you think the ocean is where you are right now? 
Oh, that's it. I mean, we 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 left Fernando um, Monday morning, so we no Tuesday morning. Sorry, so we so we've been at sea for basically two days now, um, and as far as how deep the ocean is at the moment, I think there's a pretty big drop off off the side of South America. So I think it goes down pretty deep as soon as you as soon as you leave the coast. But I couldn't give you an, an exact number. Deeper than I can swim, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, final question for you guys. You've been on for a few days. What's it like? What's life on the on the ship like? Oh, I think the most exciting and fun part is like also like learn how to sail. Also because it's my first time sailing me and Josh. Uh, but also it's like the people, like the connections you make, like the talks at the at the night, seeing the sky uh, full of stars at the night, seeing um, the new. The new waves coming like different at, at night as was saying josh at night is more calm but sometimes you see the waves coming and the sunrise the sunsets um i think yeah everything is good about the live aboard all right awesome well josh and nico we look forward to catching up to you a little bit later as uh this Caldes continues to sail along the coast towards salvador but thank you so much for joining us live from the ship today Thank you for having us. Thank All you. Right, thanks, guys. Good luck out there. Bye-bye. All right. So we did mention that there's the Darwin 200 leaders, five leaders joining us. And we're lucky to have Tom joining us from Austria today. And Tom got to work on the Spinner uh, Dolphin Project. So let me bring Tom in live with us right now. Here we go. Hey, Tom, how are you? Hi, everyone. Doing well back in Austria. Yeah, well, Tom, let's start off. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm 23 years old. I'm from Austria, but half English. So that made the whole communication on the island a bit easier because most people were English speaking. Um, I studied biology and, um, I got wind of this project in May and June and I applied and then I had the amazing chance to get to Fernando de Noronha last week. And, uh, the week really was incredible. Like I saw things I've never seen before and it was just a huge and amazingly beautiful island. And we got the chance to work with the Spinner Dolphin project. Um, and that was just incredible also. And we're, we're working on the films right now. All right. Well, I'm going to play your first film in just a moment, but let's yeah. set the stage. Tell us a little bit about those Spinner Dolphins. Okay. So um, by setting the stage, I'll talk about the island a bit. It's, a, it's such a special place because basically, if you think the Atlantic is about four kilometers deep, and then you have this one peak rising up in front of Brazil, and that's Fernando de Noronha, like that's the island. So there's like really deep water around it. And then these spinner dolphins are coming to the island to rest during the day. So that's that's basically why they're there. And it's one of the best places in the world to see them. Any day around the island, you'll see about like three to 400. And we had days where we went down to the bays. There's a bay called Dolphin Bay on the north coast. And we saw about 500 spinner dolphins there. And it's in the national park, so it's really protected. And it's not only the dolphins that you're seeing, like we saw humpback whales um which was amazing also and and it's just so cool to see that you have areas in the island that are so thoroughly protected where nobody's allowed to get in if it's not for research all right oh it sounds absolutely amazing 500 dolphins in one go that's yeah. that's pretty special a nice super pod okay well let's jump into it let's take a look at this video and then yeah, as sweet. you're watching the video classrooms use that chat sidebar and send us in some questions about spinner dolphins uh, and we'll you can ask you know Tom a few questions about his experiences uh, and the spinner dolphins. So here we go. This is Fernando de Noronha, a tropical island paradise 350 kilometers off the Brazilian coast. Thanks to its unique location and habitats, this is a massive hotspot for biodiversity. The island was named after Fernão da Noronha, a Portuguese trader who sponsored one of the first voyages to this island. But a better name for this place, and the one it goes by for the locals, is Dolphin Island. My name is Tom Schiedelbauer. I'm a 23-year-old biology student from Austria. 
I've always been fascinated by wildlife of all kind and I've always had a strong connection with nature. This week I've come to Fernando de Noronha to learn more about the complex lives of spinner dolphins. We'll be working closely with a local NGO to learn more about these fascinating creatures. This is the home of the spinner dolphin. With numbers in the thousands, the waters around Fernando de Noronha have the highest concentration of the species in the world. Throughout the year, there will be between 300 to 400 dolphins around the island every day. These animals are especially famous for one thing. At high speeds, these dolphins can launch themselves out of the water and spin up to seven times. They can jump up to three meters high and create huge splashes when landing on the surface. These spins may have several functions. The most likely ones are communication and acoustic signaling. The majority of the time, it's the strongest adult males that do most of the spinning. Spinning behaviour occurs frequently when close to tourist boats, but contrary to the belief of many tourists, it is not one of entertainment or interest in humans. They are showing us, but it is not exactly that. It is part of their communication. E muitas vezes é um grupo que está ali mais parado, está quietinho, e quando aproxima um barco, alguns começam a saltar, né? Até uma forma é, de deles, né? Comunicarem entre eles, avisar que tem um barco chegando, ou também pode ser um grupo de guarda, né? Justamente tirando a atenção ali do, do restante do grupo, né? O grupo de guarda ele tem essa função de tanto acompanhar a embarcação <risos> como é, para distrair, né? É, do que pode ser uma possível ameaça, um barco, uma, às vezes eles fazem isso com uma baleia. The dolphins come here to the island seeking shelter, spending their days socializing, having sex, playing and nursing their young in the protected bays along the north shore of the island. At night, the spinners go hunting together in the deeper waters around the island. Fernando de Noronha rises 4,000 meters from the sea floor as a single peak, the result of millions of years of volcanic activity and is one of only four oceanic islands belonging to Brazil. Since these are the only shallower waters in what is otherwise vast open ocean, marine biodiversity concentrates here. The north and south coast are very different. In 1988, the marine national park around the island was created by the Brazilian Ministry of Environment. It covers 70% of the shoreline and extends all along the southern coast. Here, wind, waves and swell by the South Atlantic Ocean Current hit the shoreline all year round. The North Shore, in comparison, is a lot more calm. The North Coast is also where human activity is at its strongest. In 2015, the island's popularity blew up on social media and since then, more tourists than ever before have come from all over the world to spend their holiday here. Many are on Dolphin Island to witness the spinner dolphins up close and experience the pristine nature in Fernando de Noronha's National Park. Ao longo dos últimos 34 anos que eu estou morando em Fernando de Noronha e desenvolvendo o trabalho de pesquisa e conservação, a gente observou um crescimento desordenado não só da população local mas também da estrutura oferecida aos turistas, em função da grande demanda que aconteceu em Noronha, no Brasil e no mundo, por um turismo marinho, por um turismo de praia. Então, cresceu muito o número de barcos, de carro e de pessoas. E as consequências naturais da espécie humana quando ocupa o ambiente. Thanks to past conservation efforts, the spinner dolphin population around Fernando de Noronha has been stable for 30 years. But with tourist numbers rising at an extreme pace, these fascinating animals are suffering from increasing stress levels, having less and less time to rest and socialize in peace. Human activity is endangering the health of spinner dolphins, especially that of mothers and young calves being nursed. In the following video, we will look at what is currently being done on the island to protect these unique creatures.
All right, let's get Tom back in here. Tom, it looks like you had an amazing time. Uh, and classrooms, as Tom's videos are completed, they'll be uploaded to the Darwin 200 YouTube page. So if you visit Darwin 200 on YouTube, you can see other videos, uh, the series of three videos from past Darwin leaders, uh, and then Tom's videos will be uploaded there as they're completed as well. So Tom, we've got some questions coming in here in the chat. And the first one is, what did you find most exciting about the Spinner Dolphins? Um, but I'm going to have to say the spinning. It's it's really crazy seeing them launch themselves out of the water. Um, they can jump really high, and and apparently how they how they move is that they're swimming underwater. They start spinning like while swimming underwater, and then they launch out. Um, and we found the the most interesting thing was the discussion of people where people were saying, "Oh, okay, they're doing this for fun," and then also like what the actual meaning was. And we've kind of figured out or at least they've figured out in the 30 years of research that they're doing, that oftentimes it can be like to move the pod around. So if there's if there's tourist boats, then the bigger, stronger dolphins will swim up and they'll launch themselves out of the water, they'll be jumping. Um, and then the whole pod might turn around. So it's this really intricate form of communication that they've been like developing for thousands of years. All right. So our next question carries on with that spinning. This year four class joining us would like to know, yeah. how high did you see them jumping? Well, they can jump about three meters high, um, which is which is pretty massive because they get to about, I think, two meters long. So they really like it. And it's really far too. It could be like five, six meters, I think. It's really incredible. So there's, they're so athletic, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just an incredible spectacle to see. We didn't get very close, uh, to be honest, because um, obviously they're protected, right? And then when we found out we couldn't actually film them underwater for us as a film crew that was a bit surprising because we thought oh we're making a documentary like in order to help with conservation yeah um but it's really to deter people from following them and from collecting material so it's a really really good rule in place and some things are quite strict in the island uh, which in the end we were really happy about yeah absolutely so uh you know this kind of touches a little bit on what you just said this class is wondering you know did the dolphins appear friendly or interested when you were out in the boat um we, I've got to be honest, we never actually got to, to be that close in, in the boat, um, but they do, dolphins are highly intelligent, so they are interested, but they come there to rest. So um, they're not there really to interact with humans a lot, but they are, I mean, if you are, if you happen to be in the boat and the dolphins come up, you're supposed to just like stay calm and turn the motor off or, or just um, let them swim by. And then they're very, they're very much aware that you're there. They know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Tom, it sounds like you had an amazing experience. Um, we're looking forward to the next two videos as they come out. So the next one yes. is dealing a little bit more on current <laughs> conservation. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, you were there as well to kind of see the work and kind of think about, you know, things that could be done in the future as well. So, you know, from what you saw, were there any thoughts you had at how it sounds like they're doing an amazing job already, but did you have yeah. any thoughts on, you know, other things that they could work into their programs? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, so the, the situation on the island is such that you have these two coasts on the North Shore um, where the dolphins uh, rest during the day. That's where the biggest groups are. And one of them is Dolphin Bay, the one that I was talking about before, where you'll find hundreds of dolphins and nobody's allowed to enter. It's really protected. And the other one's the harbour. And it's in the middle of the harbour where there's huge amounts of human activity. You know, there's fishing boats going in and out. There's like freighters, there's tourists, and there's people snorkeling, and there's all this activity and that's where the other you know hundreds of dolphins are resting so we've kind of thought um a big part is going to be because in, in future there's going to be a, even more and more tourists in the island last year it was about 150,000 people went there in a year so i think in future it's going to be more and more important to inform these people we thought maybe like an instructional video on how to behave around wildlife on the sh on the uh, airplane or a flyer um, I think the, the strongest thing we could do is put an area in the harbor where, so the dolphins are mostly in one area, right? So the best thing we thought would be put, to put up boys um, in the harbor, like floating boys, to stop people from entering that area. So the dolphins can rest in this like maybe 200 to 200 uh, meter square and nobody's allowed to enter. I think that would, that would um, be the strongest thing you could implement. And they're going to need something like that because there are, there's going to be so many people coming to the island in the next few years um, that they're going to need a strong set of rules. And that's kind of what our movies are going to be about. All right. It's kind of 
definitely the challenges, right? The tourism helps yeah. the local economy, but you have to find that right balance yeah. so you don't lose what's bringing people to the islands in the first place. Yeah, that's a big point because people are benefiting from from the tourists coming to the island, like the infrastructure is getting better, um, but people come for the wildlife. So they're going to have to need to preserve that and figure out a way. All right. Well, Tom, I'm so glad you were able to have this experience and were able to share it with us today. We look forward to it. Well, I'm very week. grateful. I'm also grateful to our to our sponsors and to Fourth Element, especially for Rana for sponsoring me personally. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, and hopefully we'll catch up to you as the Darwin 200 continues its voyage around the world. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm happy right. to be involved. Thanks, Tom. Take care. So me or mentioning Ranva is perfect because we happen to have Ranva hanging out backstage with us right now. So Ranva is with Fourth Element. She is an amazing cave diver. She's a member of the Explorers Club. So let's bring her in live with us right now. Hey, Ranva, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, Joe. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I was talking to you a little bit this morning and it sounds like you just had an incredible experience there. Absolutely. It was amazing. So I was I was uh, lucky enough to both join the journey. So I was sailing from Cape Verde and then to Fernando de Noronha and then at Fernando de Noronha. I was helping out with uh, with some of the Darwin projects, but also was were doing a, a research project of my own. Yeah, let's get into that research. Well, actually, before the research project, I know you were excited about crossing the Atlantic. So what was that experience like? Wow, it was amazing. Uh, I think one of my favorite things like about crossing the Atlantic was was getting to this weird um, area around the equator that's called the intertropical convergence zone. So it's literally like a belt around the globe. And here you have the northeastern trade winds and the southeastern trade winds kind of meeting. And in the middle, this very, very strange weather. There's hardly any wind, but suddenly you'll be standing there in the sunshine and then poof, it will be raining down on you. And then five minutes after it will be sunshine again. And as you're standing there and you couldn't have the sails up because there was no wind and we had no wind for about three days. So we were uh, motoring instead. But but being there as well, you can see like thunder clouds all over around. And it was like being in a, in a special different dimension. And one day it was completely still as well. And, and it was so hot too. And we were allowed to, the captain stopped the ship and we we're allowed to jump in the middle of the Atlantic and go for a swim. Oh, wow. That sounds awesome. What an incredible place to experience. And then even better because when you arrived at uh, Fernando de Noronha, uh, there was the coral transect and other things to explore. So let's hear about this research project. So we've, we've talked about wanting to do this coral transect project and you were able to kick it off for us. Yep, that's right. So um, just a coral transect is, um, this, is a, this is a project that the Darwin 200 wants to perform in key ports around the world where, it, where there is coral. Um, so Fernando de Noronha was the first place that had coral on the voyage. And with the coral transect, what we want to do really is to take a snapshot of the coral that's right there. And these pictures can be used both to compare the coral to in the other ports that we're going to see. Um, these pictures can be used for, um, for studying like coral cover, how the coral is behaving, how they're thriving. And it can be used to um, compare in future at the same place. And actually, I was also fortunate enough to do coral transects that was needed for the local scientists as well. Okay, well, let's take a look. I know you have a few things queued up for us. I know you have a few video clips uh, and a few images. So let's let's jump right into it. Let's see what it what it looks like to do a coral transect. Yeah. So if we start with, I can show you um, the first video here. If that's all right, could you play that for me, Joe? Absolutely. Here we go. This video here shows me working with the um, the local researcher. Her name is Marina aptly enough and i'm the one taking the pictures so as you can see we have a line at the bottom of the ocean floor and that's what we're using to measure and the square is the transect so i am desperately trying to stay still and, and take a picture of what's inside this square and so we can repeat that process there um, if you will play the next video again 
here you can see a bit better what it is that we're actually trying to photograph. And as you can see, it's quite challenging to get um, to get a good picture taken whilst you have swell and current trying to push you around, but also at the same time making sure that you're getting a precise picture and um, also the measurement tape as well. So, uh, so you can use that for comparing your pictures. Um, let's see, I can share some pictures here too. Um, let me see. Oh, let me see here. Not that one. Uh, just a moment. No worries. Let me know if you get any funny messages. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not getting any messages. I just need to get the pictures up here. So this is more just so you can see what the picture looked like whilst we were taking them. Now let's try again. Did that work? Yeah, here we go. So here is the, just a quick picture of, um, of the team. Uh, in the foreground, you can see Marina Cecini, um, our local coral expert and scientist on Fernando. And behind me in the white mask is our um, coral leader, um, coral Darwin leader. Her name is Heather and she's from the UK and she helped the scientists with her rudderless project. But since we were all diving in the same project and I needed help to do the transects, we all decided to work together. And that's me in the back with the black mask. And here is a picture of what the transect actually looks like. So you can see there's a line of the measurement tape up top. Um, you can do a bit of editing of the picture so you can see the numbers more precisely. But what we're looking at is the coral that's inside here. And what's funny about this one is that this is a very specific type of coralline algae that are called rhodoliths. And this is what Heather was studying as well. So this is what I used, uh, what I helped was, uh, did a transect of the rhodoliths as well for Heather. Um, but um, amongst other things of the transect, we also went for having a quick dive around the reef. And Marina pointed out this particular part of the reef, which uh, which is dead coral that you can see. And Marina explained this is dead fire coral that died there during the bleaching event in, in 2020. Um, so it's not looking very happy. You can see growth all over it, and that very much indicates dead coral reef. But whilst we were diving along, Marina got really excited because she saw fire coral. And this fire coral here um, was part of the one that died. Sorry, Rand, I just want to pop in for a quick second. The, yep. the, 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 the images didn't change for us. Oh, sorry. Let me okay. see. Uh, is that helping? Yeah, we can see the bigger view in the corner. Yep. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, so this is the coral transect that I was talking about. So it's inside the square here, as you can see, that's what the transect is. And that is what we'll be studying. Um, if you have any questions, uh, questions, of course, just write them in the chat box and, uh, and Joe will read them out to me and I'll answer them. Um, but yeah, here is where the dead fire coral was. Um, as you can see, it's got growth all over it and it's looking brown and really sad. But then Marina saw this and got really excited because this is a new fire coral. And this is fire coral that has grown back um, since the bleaching event of 2020. And this is the first time Marina has seen fire coral in this area. So this is really good news as the corals are now um, um, getting, getting back or getting better and regrowing. However, Unfortunately, there is a weather phenomenon called El Nino that's about to, rise, to come again. And that means the oceans are getting even warmer than they are. And that can put some stress into coral. And um, so that's why these coral transects are really important just to keep an eye on what's happening. And so you can compare it from, from year to year. Okay, very cool. And that's, you know, it's always good to hear some of those, you know, conservation success stories. We hear a lot of negative things in the news, but it's great to hear that there's organizations all over the world doing the work that we need. Uh, and then you have those little victories, right? Where you see coral starting to grow back. Uh, and so you kind of have to hold on to those little victories. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we do have some questions coming in. This looks like from a fourth year class. 
Uh, they're wondering how deep your dives were and was it dark down there? So we did the first uh, the first video that you could see was was very shallow. So that was about four to five meters. So I think nearly six feet, I think six to nine feet um, for the North American kids. Um, for um, the deepest dive that we did was 25 meters. Um, there was not there's not so much coral at that depth right? there is some but coral really likes sunlight and they photosynthesize synthesize so they like to be closer to the sun so you don't have to go very deep to to study coral okay lots of questions about diving here and the first one is you know are you ever nervous when you dive and what did you what else did you see in the water what kind of marine life so yes, I when I learned to dive, I was definitely nervous. Of course, this is something completely new and it's a new environment and I'm breathing underwater. So yeah, you are always a bit nervous, but nervous and excitement is part of it as well. And it's always about having a good instructor that can help you and train you. And here you can see I was diving with a local boat and local guides who exactly know what's going on. So I felt really safe and really well uh, looked after there. Um, what else we saw, like Fernando de Noronha, like Tom explained, has been really well protected for a long time. We didn't see any dolphins whilst we were diving, but we saw loads of nurse sharks as well. And nurse sharks are completely safe. Um, they're just like swimming around, really interested, trying to see what was going on. Um, we saw lots and lots of turtles. I think more turtles than I've ever seen before in my life going diving. We even went for one snorkel and in one, like at one time we saw eight turtles at once. And there are greenback and hawksbill turtles. And then we saw lots of um, spiny lobsters as well. I've never seen so many lobsters before. It was super cool. All and of right. course, lots of fish too. Very cool. So that, that answers part of year five's question. They were wondering if you saw any sharks. So we definitely saw, you saw the nurse sharks. That's really cool. Uh, and then they're wondering about uh, any jellies, any jellyfish. Uh, no, I didn't see any jellyfish actually, not this time around. We, um, we've we seen some smaller ones in the middle of the Atlantic, but not in Fernando. We didn't see any jellies there. All right, we've got one more question here for you about the coral. What, how do you know a coral is healthy? What are you looking for? How do you know? So what, so you can see on the picture, let's try to see if I can bring that back up again. Uh, let me try, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at all this computer stuff. Um, we try here, right here. So do you see that picture? Yeah, in the transact, um, yep. Yeah, so this square here, there is this is a sh this is a sheet that you can go in and get from a, uh, an organization that's called CoralWatch.org, and in here you can actually order a free sheet from them, and you can do this on like if you're lucky enough to live somewhere next to Scar Coral, you can do go out and do your own citizen science projects and study the health of corals with this sheet, um, or you can take it when you go on your next holiday. That's got coral uh, you can do it snorkeling and it's really easy and um, there you can you if your parents or if you want to do you could buy a package that can um, that can give you all the guidelines of how to do these coral watches and then you go find a coral and then you use this sheet and then you compare the lightest section to the darkest section and then you upload that to coral watch and there you know, they can they can estimate um, the health of the coral but it also goes into their survey and into their database and that helps them keep an eye on maybe not the exact same coral but at least the, well, the coral within the area okay well ranva it sounds like you had an incredible experience uh, i'm so glad you were able to kick start the coral transect for us and hopefully we can continue in each of the ports we visit uh, where there is coral and again we have to say a huge shout out to fourth element um for sponsoring our darwin leader for donating some equipment you have no idea how grateful we are uh for that Oh, thank you so much. And I'm so grateful that we're able to be part of it as well. And we're so excited to support such an amazing project like the Darwin 200. And we can't wait to see the rest of the films and all the other incredible projects that you're working on. All right, Randra, thank you so much. It was great to catch you for a little bit, uh, but we'll let you get uh, back with your day. Thanks for being with us today. 
No worries. Thank you very much, Joe. Bye, guys. All right. So we are ready for our Kahoot. If you recall, our Kahoot quizzes are true and false and multiple choice questions. It's going to be based on a little bit of coral, a little bit of spinner dolphins, and the winner will get a 50 pound uh, Amazon gift card. So it'll be important that you take down the email address I share with you shortly if you are uh, part of that winning crew. So let me share my screen here and let's get into our Kahoot action. So here we go, loading now. If you go to kahoot.it, you will find pin number 970-6724. Kahoot.it will ask for pin number. You want to put in 970-6724. If you have one-to-one -one devices, maybe a Chromebook or tablet at your desk, you can join that way. Uh, if not, no big deal. Your teacher could pop this up at the front of the room and you could shout out your answers to him or her. If you're joining from home today, you could scan the QR code with your tablet or phone and that will bring you into the Kahoot event as well. So let's give a minute to see if a few classrooms will join us uh, and then we'll get started with our quiz. So true and false, multiple choice. Um, the quicker you put the right answer in, the more points you're going to get. And as we're waiting for a couple students to join us here, let's uh, let me quickly share the email address. So if you do, uh, if you are today's winner, it is ebtsoyp at gmail.com. So if you send me a message, we can make sure that we get you your gift card. So there it is. When we wrap up our Kahoot, we'll take a look at our experiment results from two weeks ago. We have a brand new experiment for classrooms to share as well. And then of course, we cannot wrap up an event without uh, our curiosity of the week. So we really hope that students are taking some time, trying the experiments, sharing some photos with us, uh, and then trying the curiosity of the week. Last week's was a tough one. Um, so we're gonna take a look and see what last week's curiosity was after we finish our Kahoot together. Okay, so it looks like things have slowed down. So I think we might be ready to jump into our Kahoot. No, no, as I say that, we have a few more groups joining us. So let's give it another second here. Um, one thing that I will share as well is this email, classroom at darwin200.com. If you um, do the experiment and answer the questions, this is where you're gonna send them to. With the experiment, the top three answers, responders to the experiment, will receive 50 pound Amazon gift cards as well. And then if you want to answer the curiosity of the week and get a shout out during a Darwin 200 world's most exciting classroom event, you can send your answers to the curiosity of the week uh, here as well. And one more little thing to share. If you are tuning in today, take a picture of your class tuning in, post it online, any of the social media spots, you can find us at Darwin 200. Um, and then the hashtag Darwin 200 will help us find you as well. Uh, so please do share some images with us. We love to see classrooms in action and visit the website, darwin200.com. There's a live tracker map there where you can follow the ship, the Ustruskalde, as it's making its way around the world. And we're loading up pictures and video in real time from the ship. So you don't want to miss those. Okay, let's jump into this action here and let's start. Uh, our Kahoot. We've got a three second count in here. And remember, fast, the quicker you get your answer in, the more points if it's right. But pay attention because sometimes the answers could be a little tricky. So how many dolphins did Tom see at one time? Did he see 100, 250, 500 or 700 spinner dolphins? So about how many did he see at one time? About 100, about 250, about 500, around 700. How many dolphins did Tom see at one time? All right, good job, crew. Somewhere between four and 500 spinner dolphins at once. That would have been absolutely amazing to see that resting uh, and relaxing before they go out to hunt in the deeper ocean. So the legend glider is in first place. Let's go to our next question. This is a true and false question. So Fernando uh, de Neronia is known as Humpback Island by the locals. Is that true? Or is that false? Is Fernando, is the island known as Humpback Island by the locals? Or was it something else? You have 
a few more seconds to get that answer in. True or false? Ooh, we had a little bit of a split, but it is false. They did see some humpback whales, but the locals call it Dolphin Island. And rightfully so. It's the largest gathering of, of spinner dolphins. It's pretty amazing. So the lovely frog has taken that top spot. Here's our next question. You have to select multiple answers. So what did Tom tell us? Why they think spinner dolphins spin in the air? Was it communication? Was it acoustic signaling? Was it finding food or knocking off parasites? I'll give you a hint. You need to pick two of these. Communication, acoustic signaling, finding food, or knocking off parasites. All right, so we did have some who selected both. That's great. Communication was one, and then acoustic signaling. So it those may be the right answers. They may not be. That's the, be the great thing about science is we have hypotheses, we think about them, we test, we observe, uh, and then we try to find those answers. So this could change. The diligent turtle takes the top spot. We have another true and false coming your way. Fernando de Neronia was the first location that had coral that the Darwin 200 visited. Is that true or false? So Fernando was the first location with coral the Darwin 200 visited. True or false? All right, that is true. We were able to get out and do our coral transect, and hopefully we can continue it on from port to port as we make our way around the world. The lovely frog has reclaimed first place. Here's our final question. Read it carefully, listen carefully. Why conduct a coral transect? Is it for the health of the coral, to compare the coral, or to see its coverage? Or is it all of the above? So is it to look at the health of the coral, to compare in the future, to look at how much it covers, or is it all of the above? All right, so a few jumped on health right away, which is absolutely correct. Really, if you clicked any of them, you're right, but all three of them are great reasons why we would do a coral transect. Let's take a look at our podium. In third place, we have the diligent turtle. In second place, we've got the lucky panda. And holding down that top spot, we've got the lovely frog. All right, quite a bit of jumping up and down there, uh, but the lovely frog has that top spot. So if you are in that classroom, uh, let me shut down the Kahoot there, there we go. If you are in that classroom, I'll put the email up one more time. There it is, ebtsoyp at gmail.com. Send your message there. Uh, and we will get that gift card sent your way. Okay, let's get into our experiment portion of the event. So two weeks ago, we had a studying snails experiment. So Stuart was in the Darwin 200 studio, and he was working with a snail on a glass sheet, a glass window. Uh, and your task was to study snails and answer some questions about them. So let's start off by taking a look at the video and then I will announce the winners. So here we go. Let's take a look at the results video. Welcome back everyone. Two weeks ago, we set you the task of studying snails. We gave you three questions. Firstly, to observe how a snail feeds. The second task was to go into your garden and try and identify a species of snail with its English name and its Latin name. And last of all, to try and work out why a snail has slime and what it's for. Let's see how you got on. Well, firstly, if you looked really carefully with your magnifying glass, could you see the snail's mouth parts? If you look really carefully, you'll see that the snail feeds by protruding a tongue-like organ called a radula. This is covered with tiny teeth-like structures, which it uses to rasp away at its food. So this is how a snail eats, little by little, by rasping its dinner. For the second task, identifying snails in your garden, we received lots and lots of photos by email. I've picked out three winners. Clyde Smith 
sent in photos and correctly identified the common garden snail. This species is actually known by two Latin names, Helix aspersum and Cornus aspersum. Clyde put both names down, so he's absolutely correct and we'll be sending him a £50 gift voucher prize. Claire Perkins used some initiative and sent in a photograph of her class's pet snail, a giant African land snail called Harry. Claire correctly noted that the snail's Latin name is Acatina fulica, and it's one of the biggest land snails of all, growing up to 20 centimetres long. So well done to Claire and her class for looking after such an impressive snail. Our third winning entry was submitted by Rowan Thomas, who photographed a greater pond snail in his school's pond. Well done to Rowan for using his initiative and photographing this aquatic snail species. Rowan correctly noted that it's known as Limnea stagnalis. Well done to all three winners, and we'll be sending you a £50 gift voucher prize very soon. Now let's find out what this week's experiment entails. All right, so a huge shout out to Clyde, a shout out to Claire, uh, and to Rowan as well. Thank you so much for taking part, sending us in those great pictures and finding those scientific names. Now, our next experiment, you will have two weeks to send in your answers, and you want to send them to classroom at darwin200.com. Uh, and since many of us are joining from the Northern Hemisphere, you are seeing your leaf starting to change color. So let's dive into this week's experiment and let's learn a little bit more. As you may remember, from previous episodes of the world's most exciting classroom. Charles Darwin was really interested in botany, or the study of plants. He studied carnivorous plants. Those are plants that catch and kill insects and other animals. He studied certain plants that have the power of movement as they grow, and also the fertilization of orchids and other plant species. In today's experiment, we're going to look at the process of photosynthesis and the pigments plants use to transform sunlight, carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. This simple process of photosynthesis is the basis of almost all life on Earth and powers not just plants, but the herbivores that eat them and the carnivores that eat the herbivores. In this experiment today, we're going to study the pigments in the leaves of deciduous trees. Autumn is the perfect time to undertake this experiment, as the leaves change colour and a drop for the winter. To undertake this experiment, you need the following. About 10 to 15 leaves of a deciduous tree. Oaks or sycamores or beeches work really, really well. If you can, find a little bit of sand. You can use sand from a beach or sand from a play pit at your school. This is to help grind up the leaves and release those pigments. It's recommended that you have some safety goggles because the chemicals that we're going to be using uh, can affect your eyes, so it's best to have goggles on for protection. Also some gloves to protect your hands. I'll put these on now. You also need a bottle of acetone. We need about 50 to 100 millilitres. Acetone is used in nail varnish removers and is available from chemists and pharmacists around the world. So get a little bottle of acetone. Then a pestle and mortar for grinding up your leaves. A little glass beaker, ideally with a scale on the front of it to measure out to your acetone. Some filter paper, a tea strainer, ideally a, a large stick, ideally a kebab stick such as this one with a pointy end, and some scissors. Well, let's get started. The first step is you need to cut your filter paper into a strip. If you don't have filter paper, coffee paper works just as well. Here we go. I've cut a long, thin, rectangular strip. This will work just fine. Next, cut your kebab stick about halfway along its length. So you have uh, a large stick which you can wrap your 
filter paper around. Fold it close to the top so your piece of filter paper stretches right the way down to the bottom of your beaker. This is very important for the experiment. Okay, we're now ready to start grinding the leaves. This is a bit of a long process. It can take about five minutes to do this properly. Put in about 10, 10 or so leaves into your pestle and mortar and measure out roughly 50 millilitres of acetone. Just take out the paper strip for a second. Let's measure that carefully. Be very careful so you don't get the acetone in contact with your eyes. Your next step is to very carefully pour the acetone into the pestle and mortar on top of the leaves. Okay, you're now ready to start grinding. So put in a, a few pinches of sand. This will help you grind up the leaves much more quickly. And then very carefully, so as not to spill your acetate, just slowly grind up the leaves. So after about five minutes of grinding, the leaves should be reduced down to a smushy kind of paste. And if you look really carefully in, in between the leaves, there's a dark green liquid. This is exactly what you need for your experiment. I think mine are pretty much as ground down as they're gonna get. So it's time to pour it into your beaker. So first put your tea strainer on your beaker and then very carefully, very, very carefully, pour out the liquid through the tea strainer into your beaker. Wow, look at that dark green liquid there. This is perfect. Next, get your filter paper on your stick that you prepared earlier and very carefully position this into your beaker and the bottom of the filter paper must touch the liquid. Then you have to wait and see what happens. Leave the experiment alone for an hour or so and watch as the liquid is absorbed by the filter paper and rises up. If you look very carefully, different pigments should separate out. They'll be visible as different colored bands. Your task for this week is to research and find out the names of each of the different pigment types and their function in the plant's leaves. For the best results, try different types of leaves. Can you see different pigments emerge with red, green, yellow and orange leaves? Send in your answers to classroom at darwin200.com. Good luck and in two weeks we'll find out the answers. All right, so there we go. A nice fall themed experiment for the classrooms out there. You have two weeks to send in those answers to classroom at darwin200.com. Please do take some pictures while you're doing this experiment and post them online. Tag us on whatever platform that you like to use for your social media. Okay, let's wrap up today with our curiosity of the week. Last week's curiosity was a tricky one. Uh, we didn't have any uh, correct answers come in for last week's curiosity. Let's find out what it was. It was a tricky one. Could you work out what last week's curiosity might be? I have to be honest, this is quite a difficult challenge. This is a very unusual object to identify. Firstly, could you decide if it was an animal or a plant? Well, it is actually a plant, believe it or not. This is a seed pod from a very strange group of plants. There's two groups called Ibicella and Proboscidea and they produce these strange seed pods that are called devil's claws. The claws, these big hook-shaped structures at the front, hook onto the, the fur of animals the, or the wool of sheep, and they get carried, often for long distances, dispersing the seeds. So although it looks like the claw of an animal, it's actually a plant. Let's find out if anyone guessed correctly. All right. So there we go. It was a plant. It was a seed pod. Uh, that was definitely a tricky uh, curiosity of the week. Let's take a look at our new curiosity now. This week's curiosity is this object here. 
Can you guess what this strange box is? I'll give you a clue. This hole here is, is quite significant. You put something inside this hole and it stores it. Can you guess what this is? Send in your answers to info at darwin200.com and tune in next week to find out the answer. Good luck. All right, so there we go. A new curiosity of the week. We had a little hint there. Um, the experiment and the curiosities, you can always find them uploaded to our YouTube channel right after the event. You can also find them on the Darwin 200 website with a PDF with some instructions for the questions that you need to answer for the experiment. And then of course, send your answers in to classroom at darwin200.com. Wow, that was a crazy event. The hour just flew by. A huge shout out to Josh and Nico on board the Ooster Scale Day. A shout out to Tom who joined and shared his Darwin Leader Project um, with the Spinner Dolphins. To Ranva from Fourth Element who joined us and shared the work that she did on the coral transect and her crossing of the Atlantic. And then as we're thanking people, we have to do a huge shout out to our sponsors. Without uh, those sponsors, without our partners, we wouldn't be able to do the Darwin 200. We wouldn't be able to broadcast the world's most exciting classroom. So let's wrap up today's event and let's share our sponsors. <laughs>